would like to just mention one thing else quickly, and that is the, the uh, method that the white man uses, how the white man uses these big guns or Negro leaders against the black revolution. They're not a part of the black revolution. They're used against the black revolution. When Martin Luther King failed to desegregate Albany, Georgia, the civil rights struggle in America reached its low point. King became bankrupt almost as a leader. Plus, even financially, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in financial trouble. Plus, it was in trouble, period, with the people when they failed to uh, desegregate Albany, Georgia. Other Negro civil rights leaders of so-called national stature became fallen idols. As they became fallen idols, began to lose their prestige and influence, local Negro leaders began to stir up the masses. In Cambridge, Maryland, Gloria Richardson. In Danville, Major, uh, Danville Virginia, in other parts of the country, local leaders begin to stir up our people at the grassroots level. This was never done by these Negroes whom you recognize of national stature. They controlled you, but they never incited you or excited you. They controlled you. They contained you. They kept you on the plantation. As soon as King failed in Birmingham, Negroes took to the streets. King got out and went out to California to a big rally and raised about, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. Come to Detroit and had a march and raised some more thousands of dollars. And recall, right after that, Wilkins attacked King, accused King and the Corps of starting trouble everywhere and then making the NAACP get him out of jail and spend a lot of money, and then he accused King and Cor of raising all the money and not paying it back. This happened. I got it in documented evidence in the newspaper. Roy started attacking King, and King started attacking Roy, and Farmer started attacking both of them. And as these Negroes of national stature begin to attack each other, they begin to lose their control of the Negro masses. And Negroes was out there in the streets. They was talking about, we're going to march on Washington. By the way, right at that time, Birmingham had exploded, and the Negroes in Birmingham, remember, they also exploded. They began to stab the crackers in the back and bust them upside their head. Yes, they did. That's when Kennedy sent in the truth down in Birmingham. So, and right after that, Kennedy got on the television and said, this is a moral issue. And that's when he said he's going to put out a civil rights bill. And when he mentioned civil rights bill and the Southern crackers start talking about they were going to boycott it or filibuster it, then the Negroes start talking about what? We're going to march on Washington, march on the Senate, march on the White House, march on the Congress, and tie it up, bring it to a halt. Don't let the government proceed. They even said they were going to go out to the airport and lay down on the runway and don't let no airplanes land. I'm telling you what they said. That was revolution. That was revolution. That was the Black Revolution. It was the grassroots out there in the street. Scared the white man to death. Scared the white power structure in Washington, D.C. to death. I was there. When they found out that this black steamroller was going to come down on the Capitol, they called in Wilkins. They called in Randolph. They called in these national Negro leaders that you respect and told them, call it off. Kennedy said, look, y'all letting this thing go too far. And old Tom said, boss, I can't stop it because I didn't start it. <laughs> I'm telling you what they said. They said, I'm not even in it, much less at the head of it. They said, these Negroes are doing things on their own. They're running ahead of us. And that old shrewd fox, he said, well, if you all aren't in it, I'll put you in it. I'll put you at the head of it. I'll endorse it. I'll welcome it. I'll help it. I'll join it. The very, a matter of hours went by. They had a meeting at the Carlisle Hotel in New York City. The Carlisle Hotel is owned by the Kennedy family. 
That's the hotel Kennedy spent the night at two nights ago. Belongs to his family. A, a philanthropic society headed by a white man named Stephen Currier called all the top civil rights leaders together at the Carlisle Hotel and told them that by you all fighting each other, you're destroying the civil rights movement. And since you're fighting over money from white liberals, let us set up what's known as the Council for United Civil Rights Leadership. Let's form this council, and all the civil rights organizations will belong to it, and we'll use it for fundraising purposes. Let me show you how tricky the white man is. And as soon as they got it formed, they elected uh, uh, Whitney Young as the chairman. And who do you think became the co-chairman? Stephen Currier, the white man. A millionaire. Powell was talking about it down at the Cobo today. This is what he was talking about. Powell knows it happened. Randolph knows it happened. Wilkins knows it happened. King knows it happened. Every one of that so-called big six, they know what happened. Once they formed it, with the white man over it, he promised them and gave them $800,000 to split up between the big six and told them that after the march was over, they'd give them 700000 more, a million and a half dollars, split up between leaders that you've been following, going to jail for, crying crocodile tears for, and they nothing but Frank James and Jesse James and the, what you call it, brothers. <laughs> Soon as they, they got the setup organized, the white men made available to them top public relations experts. Opened the news media across the country at their disposal. And then they began to project these big six as the leaders of the march. Originally, they weren't even in the march. You was talking this march talk on Hastings Street. Is Hastings Street still here? <laughs> on Hastings Street. You was talking the march talk on Lenox Avenue. And then on, uh, what you call it, Fillmore Street. And Central Avenue. And 42nd Street and 63rd Street. That's where the march talk was being talked. But the white man put the big six ahead of it. Made them the march. They became the march. They took it over. And the first move they made after they took it over, they invited Walter Ruther, a white man. They invited a priest, a, uh, a rabbi, and an old white preacher. Yes, an old white preacher. The same white element that put Kennedy in power, labor, the Catholics, the Jews, and liberal Protestants. Same clique that put Kennedy in power joined the March on Washington. It's just like when you've got some coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong. What you do? You integrate it with cream. <laughs> You make it weak. If you pour uh, too much cream in, you won't even know you ever had coffee. It used to be hot, it becomes cool. It used to be strong, it becomes weak. It used to wake you up, now it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> This is what they did with the March on Washington. They joined it. They didn't integrate it. They infiltrated it. They joined it. Became a part of it. Took it over. And as they took it over, it lost its militancy. They ceased to be angry. They ceased to be hot. They ceased to be uncompromising. Why, it even ceased to be a march. It became a picnic, a circus. Nothing but a circus with clowns and all. We had one right here in Detroit. I saw it on television with clowns leaving, white clowns and black clowns. I know you don't like what I'm saying, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I can prove what I'm saying. 
If you think I'm telling you wrong, you bring me Martin Luther King and A. Philip Randolph and James Farmer and uh, those other three. And see if they'll deny it over a microphone. No, oh, it was a sellout. It was a takeover. When James Baldwin came in from Paris, they wouldn't let him talk. Because they couldn't make him go by the script. Brett Lancaster wrote the speech that Baldwin was supposed to make. They wouldn't let Baldwin get up there. Because they know Baldwin's liable to say anything. <laughs> they controlled it so tight, they told those Negroes what time to hit town. How to come. Where to stop. What sign to carry. What speech they could make and what speech they couldn't make. And then told them to get out of town by sundown. <laughs> And every one of those times were out of town by sundown. Now, I know you don't like my saying this, but I can back it up. It was a circus, a performance that beat anything Hollywood could ever do. The performance of the year. Ruther and those other three devils should get a, a Academy Award for the best actors because they acted like they really loved Negroes and fooled a whole lot of Negroes. And the six Negro leaders should get a, or an award, too, for the best supporting cast. 